Hello, everyone. My name is Sandra Kim, Professional Development and Strategic Programs Director for the Irrigation Association. Welcome to the Manufacturer Series webinar titled Access and Manage Hard to Reach Valves with Substation RV and CP, sponsored by HydroPoint Data Solutions. HydroPoint is the leader in smart water management solutions. Its weather track, baseline, and water compass product lines help companies maximize water savings, reduce operating costs, minimize business risk, and achieve sustainability goals. An EPA WaterSense Partner of the Year, HydroPoint combines IoT technology, data analytics, and automation to optimize irrigation, flow management, and leak detection. Its solutions deliver visibility and control to commercial government education and community sites. Thank you, HydroPoint, for making today's webinar possible. Before we start the presentation, I would like everyone to know that this session is being recorded and that all attending microphones will be muted. This particular webinar is worth one IACEU. You may record the CEU in your profile on IA's website at irrigation.org. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the chat box. The presenters will do their best to answer them before the webinar concludes. Our speakers today are Irrigation Technology Consultant, Andy Humphrey and Vice President of Sales, Baseline, Chris Wright. Andy is professionally trained as a landscape and irrigation designer and is an irrigation technology and e-commerce consultant. The founder of SprinklerSupplyStore.com and host of the Sprinkler Nerd podcast. Chris has extensive expertise in two-wire technology and associated devices, including soil moisture sensors and flow sensors. Without further ado, I'd like to give our speakers the floor. Chris? Thank you very much, and we're very grateful for this opportunity to present to you today. Andy, it's fantastic to be presenting with you once again. Uh, we've done it a number of times, and it's always a joy to speak to industry about uh, irrigation technology and advances in water management and how we are you know, working to... Uh, bring sustainability uh, more in focus for, you know, commercial applications um, at the, you know, large scale, and then, you know, trickling down into small commercial and residential as it uh, relates to baselines technology overall. So yeah, happy to be back in the cockpit with you. Awesome. Very good. So let's uh, start today's presentation um, by just kind of identifying and, and speaking to some of the common challenges that we face in commercial irrigation um, and as, how it would relate to, you know, our main topic of discussion today. But, um, you know, as we work in field, have, you know, countless conversations with specifiers, contractors, water managers, you know, some of the challenges that we often uh, speak to or speak about with those different uh, personas in the industry are outlined um, on the screen right now. So municipal roadways and pocket parks, how do you, you know, combine, um, you know, isolated areas into a common central control uh, platform, right? Where you've got hmm. medians that may not have power or they've lost power and operating off of um, you know, battery operated controllers, or if you're a parks department and you've got a small pocket park that's near a larger park that doesn't justify a large uh, controller uh, in and of itself, but you want to tie it into central control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of what we're going to speak about today and what's listed right here almost set the stage for why there is innovation to begin with, because sometimes innovation comes by identifying a problem and trying to figure out a way to solve it or make something more efficient. And, you know, today the, the products that we're going to review with you really were 
engineered, designed, and developed to solve very specific problems that really I think the industry has faced for decades. And we are just now, you know, coming to that sort of point on the innovation curve where now it becomes possible to, you know, uh, develop solutions for such things as you just mentioned, like pocket parks, where you had two zones, you know, and previously the client may not want to spend a couple thousand dollars just to monitor two zones. There wasn't enough kind of value in those two zones or ROI in those two zones. And as yeah. we look at this list, you'll see some common themes as mm -hmm. we go down. And those common themes will come to fruition, you know, through these products that we'll speak about. Yeah, for sure. You know, when we look at developments with roadway crossings and you've got a main line that runs underneath them, but you've got, you know, zones on both sides of that roadway, how do you tie those together efficiently and manage them correctly? Or, you know, two wires becoming more and more prevalent in commercial irrigation applications. And what happens if you exceed the two wire specification and you still need to expand that right. system, right? And that can happen accidentally where it yep. just gets exceeded without realizing it, mm -hmm. or it can exceed the specification because the site expands. You know, right. when that happens, historically, somebody may need to install a second controller. Oh, but now there's one water source. So now there's this level of complexity that could you can get by with, but it's not necessarily the right way to do it. Yeah. And so, you know, as we move through this, we have ways now to solve these problems with, you know, the right tool for the job versus just making something work. Yeah. Yeah. And as you know, the technology evolves across all two wire platforms, regardless of brand or manufacturer, um, you know, and these, these configurations get larger and larger, and there's more dependency on the integrity of that two wire path. You know, what happens if you've got a rupture or a problem with one segment of that two wire path that um, could you know, jeopardize the entire system. So, you know, how do we air gap them mm -hmm. and protect them so that they don't um, have a larger impact than necessary if something does go wrong? Yeah. And, and air gaps are really interesting word because it is really descriptive, but at first, you know, the audience may think, what does an air gapped two wire mean? But I think we can all identify with a large system, whether it's 40 zones or 240 zones, if it's on one wire path and that one wire is cut or has a failure or has a um, has an issue, it takes it can take the entire system down. Yeah. And so we now have opportunities to provide air gaps either after or before during the construction process to you know reduce the liability of one wire going down, the whole system goes down. Yep. Yeah, and that speaks to deteriorated wire fields as well, right? Mm -hmm. But um, we're also finding that, um, you know, in the specification and design um, world, there's more master plan communities that are getting uh, designed that are including, you know, uh, smaller spaces or even front yards of residences into the common areas um, that need to be controlled by that overall central control system for the water manager to efficiently manage it. Yeah. So. In addition to retrofits where you have communities mm -hmm. where just as you said, every home has maybe a controller, but they're between two and six zones. Yeah. You know, each. And now there are ways to take those two and six zone existing controllers, connect them together, share one main water supply and turn what was a like decentralized, you know, irrigation system into one congruent centralized system. Yep. Very good. Awesome. So yeah, these uh, conversations are common um, and becoming increasingly more common. And uh, we think we've got a, a solution uh, that uh, can be utilized to address many of those challenges. Yeah. So, it's important when Chris and I present on the product, we want, the reason we started with this is because we want you to kind of know why, okay, it's great. You have this product, but what does it do? Where do I use it? It's really for these types of situations. So we thought it was important to really speak to this at the beginning. And then, mm -hmm. you know, as we go through, you can think about what we're talking about here and how that applies. And then at the end, maybe we can revisit and see how that fits together. 
Oh, we will revisit. Okay. For sure. All right. <laughs> All right. Very good. Okay. So let's, uh, let's get into the uh, substance of the product itself. Um, and what we're going to be uh, talking about today is really a, a continued innovation on uh, what we feel is the market's most powerful irrigation control system. And that um, is a system that would include uh, the base station 3200 uh, control platform working in conjunction with some performance components that complement that base station 3200 technology known as the substation and the flow station. Now we're going to address um, briefly the substation. We're not going to talk at all about the flow station today, but um, all of these components come together to, uh, um, you know, manage a complex hydraulic situation or structure um, to be able to efficiently uh, monitor, manage, program, configure, you know, um, everything required uh, on a central control system to manage that efficiently. Okay, so if we look specifically at the 3200, you know, I think the emphasis is that it's the it's the total power of a single controller, <laughs> right? So those of you that have been exposed to the base station 3200 uh, previously, you know, that's a platform that's been proven and solid in uh, in the field for, um, you know, well over a decade now. Um, and it's got a lot of support capacity. So what we're going to be speaking to today um, is going to you know illustrate how we're able to utilize the full 200 zone capacity of the 3200. You know how we're going to utilize and manage you know potentially eight water sources that may be tied to that one controller. Um, we're going to talk about how the technology can be used to combine multiple sites or to utilize multiple water sources that are separate from each other. Um, you know, we can speak to uh, how we can control a fragmented site. And there's a lot of, you know, movement and in green infrastructure projects where you've got the landscape irrigation at grade level, but you've also got rooftop uh, uh, gardens or green roofs and terraces that have foliage on them and walls that um, need to tie into that landscape maintenance um, and that controller and how we're able to do that. And then some of the unique, you know, capabilities of the 3200 that play into this very well is the use of and utilization of prior, prior, program priorities, excuse me, and then also water source priorities and how we can use water budgets on multiple or alternative sources um, with this technology to manage that um, water efficiently and contribute to that sustainability. Mm -hmm. And then also with the 3200, it allows us to have, you know, creative expansion with third party devices so that we can tie in other sensor data and have real time, you know, visibility and automated uh, automation associated with those devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's interesting when you look at all of this and you think about Irrigation as we know it previously, historically, control systems as we as we know them today, the limiting factor, you know, it, it can seem like the limiting factor is the size of the water source. You can only irrigate to the size of the water source, but I think it's really more about wire being the limiting factor. Your control system can only be as big as one can run a wire. And, you know, that's what we're here today to do is kind of unlock that thinking that you can now think much bigger if the limiting factor is no longer wire. All right. Very good. So, you know, it's well established and well known in industry that baseline, you know, is a leader in two wire technology for irrigation systems. So how do we, you know, address or overcome that limitation um, that you speak to unless we go wireless, mm -hmm. right? So, what is wireless to wire and how do we manage that correctly um, as it would 
relate to the technology. So this is where the substation comes into play. So the substation itself has been available in market for several years, and it brought wireless two wire uh, into the cloud, uh, associating it with the base station 3200. What that substation allows is for you know two wire devices to be connected to the substation and then communicate wirelessly through the cloud to a base station 3200. And that can be you know relevant as the site expands or grows. Um, or if we've got uh, the need for um, the tie-in of sites or systems nearby into a 3200 platform, but we can't get wire between the two, right? So as we look at how a substation configuration could look, we've got, uh, you know, a urban development here with a uh, uh, need for irrigation on several types of landscapes. And, you know, we can manage that uh, theoretically with a single uh, 3200 base station controller on one of those sites that is then wirelessly communicating to surrounding substation controllers that are operating independent um, irrigation systems on different properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So powerful way to bring that two wire technology and that real time sensor data and that real time, you know, control of an irrigation system together through the cloud managed and accessed through one single base station interface. Yep. And keep in mind what we're showing here on the screen is technically one single site, one single city, a couple blocks but the distance is not limited. We could be showing you a map of the world and you could have a substation in Europe and a substation in South America and a controller in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's feasible that way. Not, yeah, not saying practical. that that's what you want to do, but <laughs> sometimes in order to know the capability, you, you need to talk about the extreme of that right. potential. Sure. So therefore there's, we are no longer technically limited you know, at all. Correct. Yes. So with the substation technology, um, you can utilize, um, you know, cellular communication, you can utilize uh, radio communication, and you can utilize hardwire Ethernet connect connectivity, um, and even Wi Fi can't forget about Wi Fi, right? Got yep. access points available in a unified Wi Fi network, then you could use Wi-Fi as well. So mm -hmm. it's just about networking devices together um, in the cloud to facilitate that control and management. Right, and it one key, what may help you understand the, the audience is that it's not device to device. Substation does not send a signal over to the controller. Uh, it goes to the cloud first. So both devices communicate to the cloud via a cloud connected device like ethernet, Wi-Fi, cellular, or as Chris mentioned, radio, but the radio has to have a backhaul or a gateway to the cloud. Then those two devices can connect. Correct. Yep. So from a scalability perspective, you know, you can use different networking um, protocols to connect controllers depending on, you know, either geographical uh, limitations distance limitations, et cetera. But add to Andy's point before, you really don't have to have them in a close proximity together. They can be very, you know, separated by a large distance utilizing yeah. that cloud. Connection. And, and really the pocket part example might be the best in terms of what that might look like, because yeah, you're not going to go across state lines, et cetera, unless you decide <laughs> to put a little control at grandma's house. <laughs> Otherwise you're going to have maybe a pocket park that you want to, you know, have on the same controller as the next closest controller. And then maybe that's a mile away or a couple miles away. Yep. All right. So let's bring this, you know, kind of into focus. So the, the substation, you know, has a support capacity of, you know, alone, a single stuff substation can control a hundred valves, three points of connection, 
right? And numerous, you know, sensor devices. So the scale of the substation itself is quite large working in conjunction to the total capacity of a 3200. So how do we drill that down, right? What if we don't need a full substation performance component? Mm -hmm. We just need to operate a few valves, right? Yep. That's where the substation RV, which is a new product for baseline hydropoint comes into play and where the uh, substation CP as a separate product works in conjunction with the 3200 as well to kind of bring that into better resolution to solve some additional or micro challenges that may be associated with a particular system. Okay, so let's first talk about substation RV. So the substation RV allows you to control and integrate hard to reach or what we refer to as orphan valves into a base station 3200 configuration. And by doing that brings it into um, its cloud based, you know, control environment. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, scaling down the previous example with the full substation, if you've got a site where you've got, you know, a commercial uh, property where you've got uh, several smaller station count controllers hung on walls throughout that development that you have to run around and, you know, manually program, um, they're not necessarily part of a unified central control platform. So you can't, you know, shut them down altogether for a rain event or whatever that may be. The substation RV um, helps to streamline that process by giving you that cloud-based valve control for up to six solenoids, right? So now you can have a single 3200 as the essentially primary controller on a site and then have the substation RVs um, that are controlling a small number of valves across that development, communicating in the cloud to that 3200 to give you that valve control. Yep. And a, just a quick housekeeping. I've been typing some answers into the, the chat answers. Yep. And uh, one, Scott Mama just asked a great question that I thought we should point out. Okay. And just as a reminder for those that have been using baseline for a long time, that this is exclusive to the 3200 platform, not compatible with the base station 1000 controller. Correct. Yep. If you have a 1000 controller and would like to utilize this, there are some ways to upgrade that to a 3200 and uh, you don't have to replace any of the devices in the field should you want to do that. So it's a very easy upgrade. Excellent. Very good point. All right, so with this substation RV device, again, um, it's a you know a focused uh, performance component that uh, gives you the ability to operate six solenoid devices or six zones that may not be associated with the primary wire path or the wire path has been deteriorated over time or eliminated um, and you know, those valves may currently be operating off of a battery operated controller independently, right? Without mm -hmm. any access or connection to uh, the central control platform that the 3200 is managed on. Yep. And really, as we look towards the future, every device will be, will be managed. So this is the, you know, one step closer to getting to that every device management. Yep. So as we talk about this as, as, you know, wireless two wire, Andy, right? So where's the wireless aspect of that come in? So let's see. First, it may be helpful to not go all the way back on two wire, but baselines two wire sends and receives data, send mm -hmm. a signal out to a baseline decoder, a signal comes back to the controller. It's a two way data communication protocol. And what baseline is engineered is a way to take that same protocol, but instead of sending it down a two wire path, 
it goes Physical to the cloud wire path. Yeah, going down a wire path, it goes to the cloud down to the substation and is received there. And then again, it goes back through the cloud to the controller. So we have this two-way communication protocol. Instead of going through a wire path, it goes through the cloud. Correct. And yep. it's the important part is it's real time. There are other wireless protocols that exist in the world, but they they don't operate, you know, what we consider real time. You usually have a delay of one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, or even greater for sending and receiving data. And this is a this is a real time um, sync. Absolutely. And when we speak of, you know, wireless to wire, are we wireless from the substation RV to the valves themselves? The valve is still the valve solenoid. So let's define that. The solenoid is wired to the substation. Correct. But that substation box is wireless to the cloud. Excellent. Very good. All right. So, you know, this is uh, an actual picture of a substation in the wild, just to give you, a, you know, a sense of what it would look like installed in the landscape. And this particular project um, was just as we spoke to before, um, you know, a collection of numerous, um, you know, small configuration, you know, or zone count controllers that were not part of a central control system. So they were all standalone, small zone counts, difficult to, you know, run around and manage by programming or turn on, turn off, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it makes it uh, very uh, useful to uh, have that control now go to the cloud, uh, back to a primary controller, aka base station 3200 for that real water management and control mm -hmm. capability. Yep. All right. Very good. So, you know, that begs the question, what is the, you know, kind of support capacity of the substation RV compared to a traditional substation? Um, so the zone capacity of the RV is six, um, you know, it operates on conventional wire only. So it will be conventional wire from the substation to the valve or to the solenoid itself. Um, that total wire distance, however, can be 1500 feet, which is quite extensive for um, that conventional configuration. It's in a plastic con uh, enclosure rather than uh, metal. Um, it does utilize uh, LTE communication protocol only. So this, unlike the substation, uh, only communicates to the cloud on cellular LTE. Um, and it does not have any kind of uh, built-in display interface, right? And then it doesn't state on this you know, slide specifically, but in a 3200 configuration on one 3200 controller, we can have up to eight substations pointed back to that 3200 controller. In addition, we can have up to 25 substation RVs pointed back to that one 3200 controller as well. Okay, so again, from a scalability perspective, it's kind of, you know, mind blowing how you can tie in that number of different small configuration controllers into one controller platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and part of building an effective product is trying to make a product as, you know, cost effective or cost efficient as possible. And so one of the ways to achieve that is not to put an expensive display, as you said, Chris, on the controller, but you still need a way to access it and to program it. And so I think it's important, and there you go, for users to realize that if you open the box, there's no display and you might scratch your head and wonder, how am I going to program this? Do I need to go back to the days of plugging my laptop into this in the field and I can't see it? How does this work? But there is a web display that you can easily access to do all the initial config. Correct. And then once that initial config is done, Andy, do you need to really access the substation RV that, anymore? That's it. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, you know, setting up a 
uh, consumer product at your house, once you connect it to your Wi-Fi network, you point it to the server. In this case, you point it points to the baseline server and it's set up and connected. There's no need to access it again unless it's for a troubleshooting purpose again. And that's where having a display is helpful. It's when something's not working, but there's no need for you to do it, access it on a regular basis. Yep. So any of the the zones that are connected to that substation are then, you know, programmed in the, um, you know, total base manager 3200 interface, just like their normal zones that are connected directly to the 3200 on a wire. Mm -hmm. Yep. And again, if you've got a site that has three wires that haven't worked for 15 years, and so you put some battery operated controllers on those three valves now you can put a substation there connect it to the controller and when you either manually run it at the controller from the cloud or through programming signal comes out of the controller goes through the cloud drops to the substation and the valves come on just as if it's part of the complete system it's just a couple other zones but they're wi they're wireless to the controller yep excellent perfect description all right so that kind of summarizes or gives an overview of the substation RV product. What about the substation CP and how is that different, right? So the substation CP, CP stands for control point. And for those of you that are familiar with baseline, you know, technology and, and vernacular, CP is a control point, right? And a control point is um, any... Uh, point on a hydraulic structure where we want to utilize a master valve and a flow sensor, right? To get data or to facilitate control. So the substation CP gives us that ability to control a master valve and to interface with a flow sensor where we can't get a wire from the base station 3200 to that point of connection. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the the uh, electronics uh, are slightly different when it comes to operating valves than it does to monitoring flow and sensing flow. And that's why there's two separate product lines because what you know baseline found is that people typically have a valve problem they're trying to solve, or they have a, I need access to this flow sensor or this remote pump station problem to solve. So there typically are either two distinct problems to solve or, there's all combined, and that's where the traditional substation comes in. So those are kind of like, this is the third, you know, the third leg of that total stool. Definitely. Yep. So with the the substation CP, you know, it's it's shown here uh, connected to a, you know, a, a plastic T flow sensor um, in a, you know, master valve. Um, will it interface with any type of flow sensor? Long as it's a pulse output type flow sensor, you can communicate with it. Or an ultrasonic flow sensor yeah. as well. Something that just right? has a, a pulse output wire. Yeah. Yep. If, the, if your flow sensor is ultrasonic, but it doesn't have any outputs, then you can't communicate with it. Yeah. And the, the substation CP um, is unique in that it's got the master valve you know, two wire and the flow sensor two wire built into the cabinet itself. So it gives you the ability if you've got existing flow sensors out in the field that you have lost a wire to and can't get a new wire to it, you can install a substation CP and have it wired to the flow sensor and then have it communicate uh, through the cloud to the base station 3200, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, yeah, again, there's design cases for that at, you know, pre-construction during the design phase, there are uses for this and there are, we can all think of plenty of retrofit opportunities for this also, but keep in mind, if you are an irrigation designer, this could be a great solution for a large site that maybe has a pump station, but you're not planning to run any irrigation wires into that area. You could put one of these there to, you know, share the flow off of it. Absolutely. Yep. So as we look at the CP compared to the, you know, original substation, you know, there's no zone capacity 
um, associated with the CP itself. It's just a master valve and a flow sensor. So, you know, as opposed to the substation that can support three flow sensors and three master valves, the substation CP just supports one of each, yeah. right? Um, conventional wire, um, it uh, gives a wire distance similar to the um, substation RV at 1500 feet. Again, LTE communication and no built-in display. Yep. And um, let's, um, Craig Stockhouse has a great question on point okay. here. Can the CP run a pump start relay or is it strictly master valve flow sensor? It is strictly va master valve flow sensor. So you would need the substation on the left here for uh, pump start pump control. Station. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, um, all right. So with that being said, let's kind of circle back to our original opening slide where we're talking about the substation technology solutions with the same challenges um, that are faced. And in the Q&A or in the chat, you know, drop in um, which product would be suitable to uh, address these different challenges that are commonly faced. So in a municipal roadway and pocket park application, which substation technology would you deploy in that scenario? Is it one of them? Is it all of them? What would it be? Yeah, I mean, we, we're not really asking a specific question. So there's, yeah. you're not wrong if you put one of them. <laughs> you're right. Uh, but, you know, in the, in this case, you could use all three. You could use the substation, you could use the substation RV, or you could use the substation CP. Yep. Um, just depends on what you're needing to access in that pocket park. Is it a, just valves? Is there a flow sensor? Or do you need even more than that? Right. Do you want exactly. to run two wire there and add 26 more zones? In a development that has ro roadway crossings, you know, not really that different than municipal roadways where you're trying to hit medians with irrigation, right? But in this with rail roadway crossings, it's about jumping that roadway, yep. right? Being able You've to get been, control across you, it. You guys have been digging for two days and you can't find that sleeve. We have the solution. <laughs> Okay. Uh, sites that exceed two wire specification. Okay. So this one for me is, uh, and the next one, the air gap two wire runs it, uh, you know, could instigate a deeper dive discussion on how we can manage that correctly. Uh, but with the substation itself, um, you know, that product has the uh, transformer that can support a full substation configuration. So in essence, you're really ex expanding your two wire uh, reach with the substation associated to a 3200. On a 3200, you can support up to 16,000 feet of wire field. On a substation, you can support up to 16,000 feet of wire field as well, right? So combining those together, you can support a large wire field um, with the technology that would, you know, previously be unfeasible or yeah. and, severely you know, cost prohibitive. And, and sometimes um, zones are designed small. Uh, you know, small GPM, sometimes are designed really large, depending on the water source. So you can get into these long, you know, golf course development type projects where you end up with really, really long wire paths, but you're not at your 200 zone count yet. Maybe you're only at 80 zones, but you've hit that maximum wire length. So now you, you're limited by wire or total wire, as you said, now we can go beyond that. Yeah. And with that, you know, additional um, transformer capability, um, you can also 
you know, enhance or expand the number of concurrent zones that you can operate at one time as well. That's a fantastic uh, ad there. We did not mention that. And it may seem like 15 concurrent is a lot, which is baseline's maximum. But on a really big site, you may want more than that, or you may want to actually fire zones that aren't irrigation zones and run them concurrently. So by adding another transformer, again, power and wire is no longer the limiting factor. Yep. So, you know, in, in the base station 3200 configuration, you can operate 99 concurrent zones, but only 15 of those can be actual solenoids, right? Yep. But if you've got a 3200 with its own transformer and a substation with its own transformer, you can run 15 on the 3200 and 15 concurrent on the substation as well mm -hmm. for a total of 30. So, yep. and, and previously those would be maybe two different, you know, uh, sites, but now we're saying they can be one. So you could have 30 concurrent zones, you know, running off one hydraulic infrastructure, depending on how it's designed. And I do, I don't know if this is a trend, but I feel like I'm seeing designers design smaller zone sizes. When you think about it, it's actually maybe a better way to design because you have better resolution. You're not trying to water this great big area that's really diverse. The smaller your zone size, you know, the more fine tune you can make your site. Yet, historically, you couldn't run multiple zones together very well. So it wasn't designed that way because the control systems weren't capable of managing that, right? So what would be the best system would be just simply sprinkler valve and head, but we don't have systems today that are capable of yeah. doing that. Yeah. All right. Very good. We've uh, come up on our 45 minute, uh, you know, discussion period. We've got a number of uh, questions in the Q and a that um, we've we had a couple Chris on power. Let's talk about the, again, the power requirement for the awesome. substation. Yeah. So for the substation, uh, you know, suite of products at this time, um, they require, you know, AC direct power, right? However, with that being said, we do have a solar configuration for the um, substation product currently. Um, and we will soon be releasing a solar uh, capability for the RV and the CP. So now if we've got truly orphaned areas, um, where you don't have a power drop, can't plug a RV or a CP in, you'll be able to use them in a solar configuration um, as complete off the grid standalone units. So in regards to solenoids, currently they're AC operated solenoids, everything. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then, you know, questions come in also regarding grounding. Mm -hmm. um, on these devices. So the grounding of the, uh, you know, RV and CP enclosure devices would, you know, match our grounding requirement for a controller itself. And then um, you really don't need to ground the, the valve wires on the uh, substation Conventional. RV. Um, and the only way you would really need to ground the uh, wire path for the flow sensor is if it exceeds um, 600 feet. Yep. And I did answer in the chat, we had a question about soil moisture sensors, which is excellent because you know that's part of the, the foundation of baseline and those cannot be plugged into the CP or the RV, but they can be connected to the traditional substation. Substation, correct. And that would apply to any other baseline device other than the valve flow sensor or master valve. Any of the other baseline devices can be used, but it must be on the full substation. Very good. And then we had a question come in too. How would battery operated valves communicate with the substation? Battery operated valves would not communicate with the substation but the valves would communicate to the substation and the substation would then communicate to the 3200 right for it would replace that 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 uh battery operating yep. controller correct very good 
Great questions right. coming in. Appreciate the interest. Um, yeah, Good to see uh, so many familiar faces uh, on the participant list. Love it. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you joining us. And uh, good to at least see a name on the screen that's familiar. Love absolutely. It. We miss we miss them on Tech Talk Tuesdays, <laughs> right? So awesome. Very good. Well, I think we've uh, you know used our time and um, you know communicated our uh, presentation. So. With that, we're going to turn it back over to the IA for a wrap up and conclusion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. And please don't forget to check the Irrigation Association's website for upcoming webinars throughout the year. Thank you to both Chris and Andy for sharing their knowledge with us today and to HydroPoint for sponsoring the webinar today. If you have any questions that you think of later, please feel free to email them at education at irrigation.org and we will pass them on to the appropriate team member. This concludes our webinar. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.